Trumpcast is brought to you today by Helix Sleep, a new kind of mattress company. At Helix Sleep, they run a 3D biomechanical model of your body through proprietary algorithms for a custom ergonomic mattress and the best night's sleep of your life. For $50 off your mattress order, go to helixsleep.com slash trumpcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You know, she's got this goofy friend named Elizabeth Warren. She goes, and Donald Trump is a terrible person. She gets nothing done, nothing passed. She's got a big mouth. That's the best you could come up with? Calling on Donald Trump for help is like if your house is on fire, calling an arsonist. Hello and welcome to Trumpcast the show about the man who Richard Nixon predicted would be a winner in politics, Donald Trump. I'm Jacob Weisberg. So when we want to reach for the worst political insult available for someone on the right, what do we say? We say, he's a fascist. And a lot of people have been saying exactly that about Donald Trump, based on his racism, his enthusiasm for violence, his attacks on the free press, etc., etc. Who calls for a ban on Muslims? A fascist, right? But does it make any sense to talk about Trump that way? Today, I'm going to talk about that with a historian who knows as much about fascism as anyone alive. But first, Donald Trump tweets through history. June 12, 2016. Appreciate the congrats for being right on radical Islamic terrorism. I don't want congrats. I want toughness and vigilance. We must be smart. November 23rd, 1963. Tons of people reaching out to say, Donald, you were right about book depositories. I really, really appreciate it. Governor Conley should resign. I like governors who don't get shot in the hand. May 7th, 1937. Appreciate the congrats for being right on hydrogen after Hindenburg explosion yesterday. We need to get tough on this element. Let's get it off the periodic table. I've been saying so for years. April 11th, 1912. Appreciate the congrats on being right about the Titanic. Many dead. Horrible situation. I called it. Ships should resign. They sink. June 3rd, 455 A.D. Really basking in the glory of being right about the Vandals today. They sacked Rome. Lots of blood. Lots of destruction. Emperor Valentinian should resign. Sad. August 26, 79 A.D. Horrible eruption at Mount Vesuvius. Praise for me flowing faster than the lava I was right about. Very sad. Today's Trump tweets were written by Steve Waltine and performed by John D. Domenico. Trumpcast is brought to you today by Helix Sleep. You know, night after night, two people lay in the same bed, but when it's time to buy a new mattress, only one gets his or her way. Until now. Introducing Helix Sleep, where you can buy mattresses online customized for both sides of the bed for hundreds of dollars instead of thousands. Go to helixsleep.com, answer a few simple questions based on your preferences, and the result will be a custom sleep profile used to build you the most comfortable mattress you'll ever sleep on. Your mattress will arrive at your door in about a week, and shipping is 100% free. And for couples, Helix customizes each side of the mattress personalized to suit each of your bodies and the way you sleep. Helix customers report a 30% improvement in overall sleep quality, and who couldn't use that? You have 100 nights to try it out free, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up and give you a 100% refund, no questions asked. That's why everyone from GQ Magazine to Forbes are all talking about Helix Sleep. Go to helixsleep.com slash trumpcast and get $50 off your order. That's helixsleep.com slash trumpcast. 
My guest today is Stanley Payne. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and one of the world's leading historians and thinkers about fascism. He's written books about the Spanish Civil War and the Franco regime, and he's the author of A History of Fascism, 1914 to 1945. Professor Payne, uh, welcome to my show. Thank you very much. So what's a good working definition of fascism? Uh, this uh, it perplexes political scientists and historians because it's uh, probably not as simple as in many other kinds of political movements. Uh, for a working definition of fascism, you have to posit a form of extreme nationalism that has a certain kind of a political philosophy, a philosophy of violence, and a philosophy of anthropological revolution. So you, you can't do it very well in seven or eight words. The people who tried to do that have always fallen rather wide of the mark. And I think you, you wrote a whole book about exactly this question about the definition of fascism, and there's a kind of checklist almost in it, you know, things like, I've got part of it in front of me, you say, you know, the creation of a new nationalist authoritarian state that's not based on traditional principles or models, you have a point that emphasizes the use of or willingness to use violence, and there's some really interesting points here, you say extreme stress on the masculine principle and male dominance. Right. Uh, some of these things on a checklist of fascism one can ignore because all radical movements have certain things in common. Uh, fascism and communism, for example, have a great many things in common, and some people have claimed there, there isn't much difference. Actually, there is. There are a few things about fascism that make fascism different from other kinds of radical, violent, authoritarian movements. Uh, fascism has a particular philosophy of violence that I call the, the therapeutic philosophy of violence. But violence is, in fact, is not merely necessary, but is good for you. That's why I use the term therapeutic, that violence is a positive good in, in many situations, more than merely a necessary evil. Another thing about fascism is that it's looking not toward a socio-economic revolution so much as a kind of anthropological revolution, the creation of a, a, a different kind of human being on the basis of culture, on the basis of politics, on the basis of, of nationalist values, the human being uh, that is willful and disciplined and vigorous and, and potentially violent. Uh, that's the most revolutionary aspect of fascism. And those are probably the, the two things about fascism that differentiate it from the extreme right on the one hand of the normal sort and communism on the other. Yeah. So having thought about this in the way you have and spent a lifetime studying it, do you think fascism is a useful or relevant term to use when we're talking about Donald Trump? No, no. Although fascist uh, grouplets still exist, you can find some kind of sort of neo-fascist movement in almost any country of any consequence or any degree of, uh, let's say, intermediate modernization. Uh, these are all uh, irrelevant. Uh, and in, in fact, the more neo-fascist groups you find, the less significant they are. Uh, fascism really could not function after 1945, because fascism, I, I, I would argue, was the most peculiar of all of the radical revolutionary movements of the 20th century, and could only work during certain, uh, in certain kinds of political and international and cultural contexts. And those contexts all disappeared after 1945. Uh, the neo-fascists since that time have been doomed to failure. There are all kinds of obnoxious people in political movements in the world today, but none of them of any significance are what you would call neo-fascist. There's something else, and it's important not to conflate. So there's no country in the world that you would say has meaningful fascist politics or has a, a, a leader that you, who you would define, describe as a fascist? No, not, not really, not even Russia. Russia obviously comes somewhat closer, but even Russia is not genuinely neo-fascist. Vladimir Putin, for example, is essentially an opportunist above all else, uh, more, more so than other kinds of political leaders. Fascists, of course, were opportunists, but, but Putin does not espouse the fascist ideology. In fact, he has come in the last few years to trying to uh, present himself as a kind of neo-traditionalist leader, as a Christian leader as a supporter of traditional and Christian values. Uh, this sort of language was used by fascists, but Putin uh, has been in power for 15 years, 
and has not really tried to create a new kind of movement system or a revolutionary system, but uh, simply a, a kind of power state based on authoritarianism and nationalism without adopting a, a fascist doctrine of violence and without adopting any kind of cultural revolution. Uh, he, he now pretends to be a Christian neo-traditionalist. It's a pose, of course, but that's not fascism. And one won't find real fascism anywhere. Uh, what is n notable, I think, in, in the last couple of years have been the development of the more populist, uh, nationalistic right-wing movements in various other countries. Putin, of course, does reflect that to some extent in Russia. You find it in a variety of, East, of European countries, both East and West. You find it uh, in a the most modern of the Middle Eastern countries, which is Turkey, under the increasingly authoritarian leadership of Erdogan. And uh, perhaps uh, Trump in the United States represents a variant of this kind of uh, new uh, populistic uh, right-wing nationalism. But it isn't fascism. It doesn't have these specific characteristics of fascism. Even though it seems to draw on some of the ones you talk about, including the willingness to use violence, the masculine role, the, the, the populism, is it, you, is it, you would always shy away from the term fascism because you think fascism was a historical movement that is over. Well, it, 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 it is over, and, and you can't repeat history the same way. But uh, Trump likes to use colorful language. He does not have any kind of shirt movement that is out rampaging in the streets. So uh, just because he occasionally uses tough language and uh, likes to bluff and bluster, this is not the same sort of thing as leading a shirt movement that is beating people up in the streets. In fact, what we see at Trump rallies is not that the Trumpites so much are beating up the opposition, but the opposition comes to protest rather violently against the Trumpites. So that violence factor there is the other way around. Well, at least in both directions, he certainly encouraged violence against protesters and violence that is rallied. Well, he's talked about it, but we're looking at who actually does it. Mm. Actually doing it is more important than bluffing and blustering. So, but don't, doesn't this, uh, some of this have to be updated? I mean, you wouldn't have a shirt movement of people goose-stepping in the streets now. Surely the contemporary version of that would be something that would be organized and expressed on social media. Uh, that, that, that would be a, a 21st century way of doing it, and you see a good example of that, for example, for a kind of Marxism-Leninism in Podemos, the new left-wing, what is mistakenly called populist movement in Spain at the present time. So you're, you're right about that. But the problem is when, when the, the particular forms and values and expressions of these things change so much, not just in one dimension, but in several, in, in a variety of key roles, it doesn't do any good to use anachronistic terminology. You have to understand each kind of problem, each kind of new movement or political expression really on its own terms. And if you use anachronistic terminology too much, you end up conflating. And this may be very good in, in terms of kind of a political mobilization to rally people around a pejorative. That is, it's very good as a negative term, but it doesn't help very much as an exact positive definition of what we're really dealing with. Was fascism ever a meaningful movement in any way in, in America? A lot of people have pointed, obviously, to the fact that Donald Trump uses the slogan America first, which was a slogan of American fascists in the 1930s. Yeah, but remember that America first was uh, anti-internationalist and, and was on the edge of pacifism as far as international affairs was concerned. Uh, it was a very specific kind of formation to keep the United States out of the war. There were several kinds of American more or less fascistic movements in the 30s, very small outfits. And in fact, Humphrey Bogart starred in a movie uh, about one of them. Uh, it came out around 1933. The Silver Shirts, and there were one or two others. So they did exist. But uh, as movements, they're very small, and they're never any really th real threat. The kind of outside threat uh, in American politics came from the old-style Southern demagogue like Huey Long. Huey would have been happy to have been a nationalist, but uh, his approach was really more left-wing than right-wing. And he was the only politician that Roosevelt was worried about coming in from the outside in 1935 until Long was assassinated. So the answer is yes, there were American fascist movements because there was some effort 
during the 30s to imitate fascism in just about every country, even outside of Europe, not just uh, within Europe itself. But they couldn't mobilize and they never amounted to anything. But they, they were here, yes. Sinclair Lewis wrote a famous novel called It Can't Happen Here, which is uh, sort of imagines fascism in America. I think it was written in 1935. And uh, I don't know, it's not a very good novel. I read it not that long ago. But what's interesting about it is the idea that what, that fascism in America, if it ever if it ever came, would be very different, that a lot of the hallmarks you saw in European fascism wouldn't be the same here. And in fact, American fascism would probably be hostile to European fascism. Uh, something like that. That, that, that. That's a good point. And one of the things that's been always difficult about uh, analyzing fascism, even during the fascist era, was that being uh, an ultra-nationalist movement, fascism took somewhat different kinds of expressions, even in different European countries. And uh, in fact, uh, Mussolini, for a number of years, was pretty hostile to Hitler. It was Mussolini who was the only leader who rushed to defend the independence of Austria in 1934 when the Austrian Nazis tried to overthrow violently the Austrian government. Uh, so uh, you, you, you find these differences among fascisms, uh, just as you find later on differences among communisms, once you have Asian communisms, as well as the Soviet East European variety. So that, that, that point is, is very well taken. I was surprised that anti-Semitism wasn't on your checklist. Where was there fascism without anti-Semitism? In Spain? Uh, well, in Italy. Remember that the Italian fascist movement was disproportionately Jewish until 1938. Only uh, when uh, Mussolini finally decided, after being pretty negative about Hitler for a long time, that he probably was going to align with Germany one way or the other, then he had to defend the Italian population from being a kind of South European untermenschen, and so suddenly defined a, a new kind of Italian racism, which was pretty hard to do, the Italian race as a unique race, and then began to adopt anti-Semitic legislation. But down to 1938, for the first 19 years of the fascist movement, the number of fascists in the uh, Italian fascist party was proportionally greater than the very tiny minority of uh, Jews in the general Italian population. Uh, Mussolini helped uh, in the early 1930s to try to build up a kind of Zionist navy as a tool against the strength of the British Empire in the Middle East. So Mussolini uh, had even been pro-Zionist in a very covert kind of way. The Spanish movement officially disavowed anti-Semitism. The Dutch Nazi movement made it clear that uh, any Jew who was willing to be a good Dutch patriot could join the Dutch National Socialist Movement. So uh, anti-Semitism, uh, despite the fact that it was a raison d'etre for Nazism, is not necessarily on the checklist for any kind of generic fascism. So, Professor Payne, I think you've convinced me that we shouldn't call Donald Trump a fascist or a neo-fascist. What should we call him? Well, uh, uh, well uh, if you want to find a new label, label for him, uh, I think it has to be in the sort of thing that I was talking about earlier, that we have this tendency in, in uh, relatively advanced countries, even a Muslim country that is semi-advanced like Turkey, to have new kinds of right-wing nationalist leaders who uh, play very much a kind of populistic uh, political card, uh, appealing to the ordinary population, not in terms of class, but in terms of simply being the majority of the ordinary population and in terms of certain aspects of national values and national traditions. Uh, they don't propose to overthrow the system. They don't even perform, propose necessarily to transform the political system itself, although Erdogan certainly is doing that in Turkey, and Putin has done that in Russia. But they want a, a quite a different kind of policy by the national governments, which is uh, much more right-wing, more nationalistic, and also more populistic. As a historian of political movements, what else would you observe about Trump or the Trump phenomenon? Well, I, I think we, we, we've defined the, the, the essence of that in terms of a serious comparative political analysis. Now, in the United States, I, I think that uh, uh, every indication is that uh, uh, Trump will be rather hard to put this over and pull this off because although there will be a, a, a very large minority of American people who respond to it, I don't think the majority of them are going to. So I don't think this will work. But it works in Turkey. It works in Russia. 
It works in East European countries, uh, and in fact, uh, even in in, in non in in, in uh, Central and West European countries, uh, the populistic right uh, in several cases is becoming stronger. I don't think it, it is likely to be successful in the United States. Would you go so far as to say that the uh, American system would reject Trump's brand of populist authoritarianism for some of the same reasons it was less prone to fascism in the 1930s? Uh, yes, in, in, in very general terms, that would be correct. I don't know that we can say that, uh, that, that Trump is really uh, yet an authoritarian, as we use the term in, in comparative uh, national political systems. He wants to change, uh, he wants to institute some drastic new government policies, but he has not changed, that does not propose any change in the structure of government. Now, of course, uh, there is the tendency for, for these uh, movements to operate in a kind of Trojan horse fashion. So you, you could never be sure where things are going with something like this. Professor Payne, thank you for joining us on the show today. Uh, thank you very much. That's it for today's show. Special thanks to Steve Waltine and Second City for today's sketch. John D. Domenico is our voice of Donald Trump. Today's show was produced by Jason DeLeon and Henry Malofsky. Steve Lichtai is the executive producer of Slate Podcast. Andy Bowers is our chief content officer. I'm Jacob Weisberg. Thanks for listening. June 20th, 1993. Saw Jurassic Park last night. Tons of people congratulating me for being right about dinosaurs. Should wipe out all the dinos on the island. Spielberg should resign.